Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. Um, could be a little bit different tonight, um, and I hope that you'll all listen, because I know some of you sometimes think, ooh, this is the boring bit, you've liked the singing, but, you know, we can learn, there's things we can learn, and uh, learning's actually good for you, like broccoli. Come on, who likes broccoli? <laughs> ooh, that's pretty good, isn't it? Uh -huh. <laughs> it was it? Uh, President Bush, who was the one who didn't like broccoli, and so he decided that he was going to dump a whole load of broccoli somewhere. And I don't know, he, I, I just remembered he said he shouldn't have to eat it, so he dumped it somewhere, got into big trouble. But anyway, we, we're digressing. Um, I really feel that as a church, it's up there, we're unconventional by design and often that gets us into trouble but it's who we are and like we sang earlier, we're never going back to the way we were. We believe that we've been called to promote the most beautiful gospel and uh, some of you, if you don't know what that means, you can come and ask me afterwards uh, but be prepared <laughs> for what the most beautiful gospel is um, and um, whether we like it or not, the church must keep in line, in one sense, with culture and society. I don't mean that it has to mirror it and be like it in that sense, but we must know what's going on in the world. We must also know what makes people tick. And if you don't know what, how people tick, we're just not going to get anywhere because the church becomes a subculture doing its own thing, believing its own stuff, you know, we're in here, they are out there, and oh yeah, it, it just becomes a nasty piece of work. Um, now what I'm going to uh, talk about tonight is actually something that happened. We, Jenny and I are going to partner tonight. Um, we've never done this before. Uh, I'd love it if she was studying next to me and we were just liter literally chatting it through. That would suit me fine, because I like that sort of uh, engagement. But uh, we're doing it this way tonight. Something happened last week, and... Um, I absolutely and categorically still believe that God speaks to us. Now, I, I, I'm a little bit afraid of that statement, God speaking to us, because for me now, it's a little bit religious and old-fashioned. But you all, all know what I mean by that. When there's something within you that you know that you've heard something that didn't come from you, that didn't come from your ability, it came from somewhere else, almost by a just an incredible almost you know whoosh and it's there and you just know that you know something that you didn't know before right isn't isn't that true now i believe categorically that that's still happening sometimes we don't recognize it as much as we should because just a little bit like what beth was talking about uh weeing in the the waves in the sea uh we actually gloss over very quickly little things that are really quite significant but we pass over them and then we miss the next piece of the puzzle and if we'd have only added them all together we'd have come up with something quite fantastic but we just didn't bother because we thought it was insignificant now uh, I know I'm digressing a little bit again but it's all right this morning I get a text from Kev Kev Craven I don't know where he is but it uh, doesn't matter what it was but it was only about three words because you know what Kev's like he's a man of few words three words but those three words set me on a journey because it was a word from God. Let's put it that way, from somewhere that was absolutely amazing. Now, a little later, later on, you might see why I said that. But before I get there, is that last week when I'd finished speaking, uh, I went home and I, and I, I just felt there was... I was sad, I was a little bit unhappy, and I, I, I banged off a text to Jenny, and immediately, Jenny wasn't just wanting to, oh, there, there, don't be upset, don't, you know, come on, what's wrong? It was, she immediately rose up to give me a word 
that was going to lift my spirit and set me on my way because she was being what I call the ecclesia. Now, you see, that word's a funny word, but it's actually the, the word that when the word church is written in the New Testament, it's what it really should have said, the ecclesia. See, a church is a gathering of people where you do what we're doing tonight. And in all honesty, we're getting to the point where we, we're not sure we like this sort of setup anymore. We know there's something more. There's something better. We don't quite know what it is yet, but we're on it, right? We know there's something better, but until we find something better, we stick with what we've got. Isn't that sensible? But let me just say, ecclesia is totally different. The ecclesia, when, when Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, it meant a group of ordinary people. Now put your hand up if you think you're ordinary. I'm putting mine up because I am ordinary. I'm just a human being. I've got no special powers. I'm ordinary. But when we join the ecclesia of God, those ordinary people come together and they become a, a powerhouse, which is absolutely incredible. Only if you add your bit to the pot. If you don't add your bit to the pot, we are weakened, we are uh, compromised. If you will add your bit to the pot, it's amazing. And that's why I said, when Kev sent three words to us this morning, he added his bit to the pot and he was ecclesia. Do you get me? Ooh, I'm getting excited. Right, so back to Jenny. She was ecclesia with me, and she said, oh, I get exactly what you mean. I was in a meeting in a conference this week. Now, this is a woman of education, this. She's right at the top of the education system, consultant, etc. I'm bigging you up, Jenny. Bigging you up, Jenny. She is, so she's not, she's not you know. She said, I was in a conference with Alistair, Ca Alistair Campbell, wasn't it? This week. Uh, in the audience, yes, but she was at this conference with Alistair Campbell. <laughs> See, she's frightened I'm bigging her up too much. Uh, hang on, I've got to find this now. <laughs> and um, she immediately started to tell me um, what he had said. And you might have thought, what's that got to do with what I had said? Because he really didn't, did it? He really had no connection with what I was saying. But it was the word for me. It really was. Because guess what? The subject matter of Alistair Campbell, I had been reading in an article the Thursday before. And it had nothing to do with what I was talking about on the Saturday. But when we put the two together, it was the same subject matter. So I went, I, I, hang on a minute. I've just been reading about that two days before. I need to send you that link so you can see that. And what we realized in that moment, that we were receiving insight for this house. Get me? For the way we move forward, understanding us as people. Because I'll tell you what, it is the job of the church to understand people. This is our job. Do you get it? And if we don't understand people, it's no good saying, oh, well, this is how we've always done it and this is how, you know, how we used to like it. If people in 2017 don't like this now, why are we doing it? But we still will. You get me? So, I'm going to put something, I'm going to read you an article. Now, don't get freaked out. When I use a phrase, i.e. the age of Aquarius or the age of Pisces, do you know what's unbelievable? We, as in, again, in the church, we've been shut down and stopped from embracing or listening to a wider information because we were told, careful, if you follow that, you're going to, oh, it's, it's going to be dangerous. And if you do this, you're going to... Look, we are able to find truth everywhere. Yeah? Because we were made free by Christ to be free in order that we might have the wholeness of life, not just bits here, bits there, and go around. <laughs> Terrified. Do you get me? So listen, I'm going to read this, this article, and, and you, you will see it. And you young people, see where you fit. It's amazing. See, there's another thing. Age. It's used a lot in the Bible. Even Jesus said, the end of the age. 
we, we have all sorts of connotations of what that means. But when you look at it from a, a star point of view, and yes, I am not into horoscopes, I'm not into all sorts of that, so don't again, hey, we've had weeing in the waves and now we're into horoscopes, we're really going to be in, in trouble, aren't we, tonight? But anyway, what I'm trying to say is, in the context of the stars, ages, the age, is actually a common phrase, because the stars, as they go around, the, the, the constellations, etc., it takes like 2,000 years. And the, the, the Egyptians knew that. That's why the Sphinx and the, um, the pyramids are in a particular place. Why? Because back then, where the stars were, those pyramids are exactly underneath this. I think it's the Orion's belt. Brilliant, isn't it? So don't get freaked out, but let me read you this, right? I first heard of the age of Aquarius, this is me as well, uh, from a song in the musical. Um, it was, this is the dawning of the... Ooh. You awesome sinners, you. <laughs> okay. Um, I was a teenager in the 60s and it sounded really cool. Anyway, um, there was many changes, come, but this is the bit that I want to read. Um, what was coming was a shift to the Aquarian age it was a time for people to have tools they would need to transition from the Piscean age that we had been in for 2,000 years into this new age. Now, I don't care what you call it, but according to them, this is the names they were giving it. So like I said, don't get freaked out. So what are these ages? Astronomers will tell you that the Earth rotates on an axis and that this line going through the center of the Earth has a slight wobble to it. It goes through a little circular wobble about once every 24,000 years. This cycle has been broken into 12 parts associated with the 12 astrological signs based on which constellation the axis is wobbling towards. From around 2000 BC to 0 AD, we were in the age of Taurus. From 0 AD to the present, we have been in the age of Pisces. For the next 2,000 years, we will be in the Aquarian age. We have been in the transition from Piscean age to the Aquarian age for the last 50 years. Now, why is this so important? Many people go through their whole lives not caring or knowing that what star sign they are, which is fair enough. But this change is so important that everybody on the planet is going to be affected by it. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? The Piscean age is this, has been dominated, and you can put that first slide on, please has been dominated by hierarchy and power. The key phrase for this age from the Shakespeare Spears Hamlet, to be or not to be. Is it not the right slide? It wants the Piscean age, please. Can you put that one? Yeah, that's it. To be or not to be. Um, to make a successful and happy life, you needed to resolve this question. The key to the astrological sign pieces is I believe. During this age, in order for you to be, you needed to find someone or something to believe in. Now, doesn't that ring true? Come on. If you go back, isn't that what the way things used to be? I, I believe so. It was for me. I can understand that totally. Right. Um, when you found the thing you attached yourself to, that thing, and were you were guided how to live. This could be a religion, a political ideology, a charismatic leader, work, etc. The keys to life were hidden and uh, secret in the halls of power and in the monasteries and in the ashrams. But you didn't need to know these secrets, only to follow leaders and guides who did. This created vertical hierarchies as a result, and it was essential to find your place in the pecking order. Does that sound about... Ish? I think it does. This has been the foundation for human consciousness for the past 2,000 years. Everything that you have learned from your parents and their parents going back uh, has been that. But now that is changing. Now, when I read this next bit, I think you'll begin to see totally that, that it has. Look at this. Um, the Aquarian age, can you have the next slide? Thank you. Will be dominated by networks and information, the key phrase for this age is be to be. The key to this sign is I know. This is the age of information. Nothing is secret anymore. All information is available at your fingertips. 
where the Piscean Age was organized in a vertical up and down structure of hierarchies, the Aquarian Age is organized horizontally, opening the world up to true equality. Right. During this age, the focus is no longer in your identity and existence, to be or not to be, but on accepting yourself as a whole person, be to be, who does not need to believe in something outside yourself. Now, isn't this interesting? Uh, you are ready to accept that you have the knowledge and the wisdom within yourself. It is no longer necessary to attach to something outside yourself, but to become a leader of one yourself Instead of being a railroad car that is pulled by another, you become your own engine. It is your responsibility to stay on the tracks and keep moving forward. With this understanding, it is easier to comprehend what has been happening in the world. Now, this gets very interesting. So we're going to go to the next slide now. Right, in our, can we do inner world first, please? Thanks. Um, there has been a huge movement in our inner world, in our beings. Um, tran personal transformation has been important. Have we got that up there? Yeah. So we've got self-awareness, self-improvement, yoga, meditation, tai chi, alternative healing, natural foods, etc. But listen, there has also been, now isn't this interesting, and a an major, it's not just an increase, a major increase in depression, suicide, anxiety, stress, and drug use, both pharmaceutical and recreational. Next slide. But in the outer world, there's also been great strides. It's wonderful, isn't it? We've seen changes in civil rights, environmental consciousness, women's rights, gay rights, global consciousness, etc. We have also seen the rise in fundamentalism terrorism, partisan politics, racism, xenophobia, the fear of the other, and general fear-mongering. This shift is bringing out both the best and the worst in mankind. Now listen, some people are preparing for this shift by opening up their hearts. Nice. Others don't understand what's going on and want to return to the golden age in the past or to circle the wagons and trust only those who are like themselves. Oh, that's quite, quite amazing, isn't it? Now, there's something I just want to draw your attention to with these isms. Isn't it interesting that ism, do you know what an ism is? Because when we said at the end, isms, you know, fundamentalism and all that. An ism is a distinctive practice philosophy, political ideology, a doctrine or a cause related to a belief accepted as authority. Now, what I find amazing by that is that what you've got this change of horizontal, uh, everybody's equal, nobody really has to listen to anybody else because we've all got this wisdom, yet what it does, it can either lead you to feel utterly depressed and ready to commit suicide. Why? Because you're going it alone or you swing the pendulum back the other way and go into isms, which is related to belief, where we actually become extreme to get back to the place where we need somebody to lead us and tell us everything that we need to believe. <gasps> Talk about extremes. Now, why have we brought you to this place? is because we have to build the ecclesia where we have a horizontal uh, uh, w uh, equality. Everybody is the church. Re Anth and I years ago laid down that sense that we're the boss. We, we've team, and not only team, we've extended team. We've people who, when you say you've heard, like Kev this morning, he heard something. Yeah, stand under that wisdom. But at the same time, what happens, there are people who can't stand that because it's like, I need leadership. I've got to, I've got to have somebody to, to, to help me. So let me just um, see the issue is this, that what happens when everybody believes that they are equal, there is a sense of no power. Ooh, think about it. People like to think there's, a, there's power to, uh, what's the word to go to? aspire to. Power and equality don't go together. 
They really don't. And that's why a lot of the time people struggle when we move away from what was the old to the new. But this is where we are. Now, the ch old church or the church as what people think it should be is hierarchical with you guys sitting there and somebody at the front telling you what to do. But the ecclesia is it's this way. Do you get that? It's absolutely amazing. And that is what we are determined to build. We are building an ecclesia. And I hope you, you hear that. Uh, I've just got a couple more things to say, I think. And uh, then I'm passing over to Jenny. Um, done all that, done all that, done all that, done all that. Written up that side there, I've done all that. Um, yeah. What I believe that we have to see, and Jenny might pick up on this. Hey, look, I've only been a few minutes. That was brilliant, wasn't it? Um, what I believe we must do as a ecclesia, and I think we should start probably using that word, but you don't want to use words that don't mean something to people. But what I'm meaning is church has a wrong connotation. I know it's only words, but what we have got to do is become to the point that we... Re I was talking to somebody the other day, and they'll forgive me if they think I'm... But I'm not being personal. But significance is something that we're all desperate for. Think about it. Significance. And in a community, and in the ecclesia that we're trying to build, everyone should be significant. Now, why? It's not because... Somebody can stand up and do a big talk, or somebody can sing, or, or somebody can play the piano. Yes, they are wonderful gifts, but in the ecclesia, it should be everybody with the kingdom within them should be bursting out the wisdom that they have. And in the same way that I stood under Kev this morning, and I stood under that word, and I thought, thanks, Kev. You're, you're right on point yet again. Jenny, on, on last week, uh, on, Monday, on, on Sunday, thanks, Jenny, you're right on point again. It wasn't that I needed to go find some, you know, great orator of scripture or find a book or whatever. No, my family, my community have got everything they need for me. Now, do you believe that? You'll only believe it if you're willing to be it for someone else. Don't you be sitting and waiting for everybody to be it to you. You be it to someone else. Now, I, I believe categorically that that's where we are in society. So we've got people, young people and old, but young people are coming through who don't listen to authority at all because it's like, nah, I don't have to listen to you. You know, Jenny finds it at school, don't you? I don't have to listen to you. Well, you do if you want to pass your exams, you know. But that is a social thing. So we have to understand that's going to encroach into our organization, into our, our group. And we've got to know that that's what's happening. And then we've got to adapt to deal with it in order to say, come on, we've got to find a way of all bringing that wisdom that we have of the kingdom to the table and that's where I'm stopping and Jenny you can carry on so I hope that set the scene <laughs> sounded like a political rally didn't it darling <laughs> hi when um, I'm mostly going to echo and it's we had a wonderful conversation and but because we've planned separately so where there's crossover it must be because you need to hear it twice um, but when I started teaching sort of 20 years ago um, Kelly, where are you? She's here. Where's Kel? Kel was in my, um, one of my first year seven classes. Um, which one do you think? How old is she now? She's about 30. That's depressing. <laughs> she was a, but generationally, all of what Chris has said, y you see it come through as teenagers come through. It was before internet and Instagram and social media and Facebook, well, not before internet, but it was before that was huge in the land of children. Um, and one, what sparked my comment last week was when I, listened to, um, when I listened to Chris talking about how Jesus learned obedience through the things he suffered. And that obedience meant to listen intelligently and to stand under. I just thought, 
that was a wonderful redefining of that word obedience for me. Because obedience for me didn't used to mean that. It meant do as, do as you're told, work out how to get it right so that the people in power, be that God or people who represent God or be that family in different ways, who, the person in power has to be pleased. Um, and that's very, very different to what we find ourselves now. I remember um, even a couple of years ago, I went to, um, I was teaching and I had um, a lesson off because I had to go on a course. And I left my class in the hands of a supply teacher. Um, it did not go so well. Um, they were horrible. My lovely, gorgeous class that I thought were amazing were absolutely vile to this visitor to the school. Um, and I said to one of my great kids, you know, you have your favourites. Any teacher that says they don't is lying. But I said to one of my favourite kids in this class, I said, what? Even you were rude. Why, why were you rude? Why? I, I don't get it. Explain. And he said, well, you only have to show respect to people who've earned it. And that was from... A, a kid that was a, you know, you, you thought he would know. And some of you in here may actually, I actually think some of you in here probably who are younger probably have that belief. I don't. I was raised that you give respect to your elders and you give respect to everybody because you give it. And so you do. Some of you have been raised, I don't have to respect you unless I think you earn it. We, are, we have got even that mix of belief in, he, in this building tonight. I've no doubt about it. Now, when Alistair Campbell was talking about the horizontal or the, the vertical, he was addressing um, nearly 2,000 school leaders. And he, was, um, he wasn't doing it out of the goodness of his heart. He was getting paid. But um, he, um, and the, um, he, he was talking about the impact of, in education and in school, this culture of there is now not this vertical hierarchy in society, how as school leaders we move things forward, not just with our pupils, but with staff. Even when I was looking after some newly qualified teachers, some of them, you know, when I was in my mid-30s, they were in their early 20s, culturally in a very different situation. Um, now, um, I'm not doing anything that's on my notes. Never mind. The, what, um, what struck me as well as this week when I was... Um, I visit a lot of schools all over the country, and um, I rely very heavily on Google Maps when I visit. And I had to go to a school in London this week, and I still genuinely do not know where it was. And yet I was there for half a day. <laughs> because when I get off the station at King's Cross, I have a little app called City Mapper. And I punch in the postcode of the school, and then it gives you a list of choices. So you can take this tube, this tube, this overground, this underground, this bus. That's how long it would take you in an Uber. That's how long. And, and I just pick the top one normally and follow it and I get there. So this particular route this day took me on a tube and then on a bus for 24 stops and I knew something was wrong. I knew it was wrong, you know, and you're thinking, it can't really be that you sit on a bus for 24 stops in London. So when I got off, um, when I got off the, the bus, <laughs> um, after my 24 stops, feeling a little bit like I don't know where I am. Um, I said to the man in the shop, I said, what's your nearest tube station? And he said, oh, about 200 yards up there, there's Willesden Junction. And I had taken an hour to get somewhere that was about 20 minutes away. Now, why? Because I'd never been before. And as I was going through this process in my head, this is why going it alone is a really bad idea because people have been there before. And if I'd have just pinged an email to the school before I went and said, what is your nearest tube station? <laughs> they would have said it's Willesden Junction. I would have got there in half the time. And what I've just written down tonight as I was li listening to Chris is, you can choose your own way in life, but I'm going to urge you to choose to be part of an ecclesia. Because if you try and get somewhere um, you've never been before without asking people who might have been how to get there, you're going to take longer. You are going to take longer. And I still got there, so in that sense, it's okay. But I could have got there quicker and I could apply that so easily to my life. The, the route I have taken round some stuff, if I had been prepared 
particularly when I was younger. I've never known as much as I knew in my early 20s. I knew everything. Oh, we had it all sorted. Um, Claire and I would sit. Didn't we know everything, Claire? We knew a lot. Um, <laughs> if I'd have just been, and that's fine, but if I'd have just at that point in my life listened to people with a few more years on them and been a bit more transparent, I could have saved myself a lot of time. And in all honesty, I am still living in consequences of decisions I made in my 20s that I could have avoided. Is it all right? Yes. Has it worked for my good? Yes. But it's been a long, 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 long way round. Now, I am a parent. My son is 14 on Monday. <gasps> Isn't, oh, I don't know where that's gone. Um, but I was thinking about this as it applies to, to, you know, parenting and all those things. I don't want Daniel to live a life of pure obedience to me. <laughs> don't miss that. <laughs> you don't really think it all. He's going to be like, oh, mum. No, seriously, I don't. And I don't, um, <laughs> I don't. Um, because that works for so long. I know people, people very close to me who were, um, and I know a lot of people, but who were um, raised with a, you will do as I told before you because I said so. It lasts you so long. I've seen it in school, I've seen it in kids, before kids suddenly think, actually, you can't tell me what to do anymore. And what we've left then is people very ill-equipped to live because they haven't learned how to live or make choices or be empowered by just obeying what has been given. And let's take a parallel into... Um, I have lived a lovely um, Christian life and I complied with it. But I tell you what, when life hit me, I didn't know how to live. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to function because the rules and the complying with the hierarchical thing doesn't necessarily, well, it doesn't empower you to choose and to live. Um, it's Because it's about actually... A partnership. Now, let me just check I'm not missing anything. Now, if we widen that out, oh, let me just read this because this is important. Um, I am going to have to, at some point, send Daniel out to live independent of me and expect him to be able to do that, which means I have to empower him to be able to do that. Um, and I wanted to widen this out slightly. Um, we meet as leaders every week, and we are so different, and we have the best conversations. And the reason why we have great conversations is because everybody just, it just says it, just brings their bit to the pot, plonks it on, and between us all and our differences and our perspectives, you, you get a greater revelation because you're all contributing to the pot. Um, now, we are, without a shadow of a doubt, getting incredible revelation, prophetic, whatever you want to call it, we are getting it. I am 100% convinced of it without a shadow of doubt in my mind, and incredibly settled. And like pieces of a puzzle, it is coming together. But I will speak only for myself and say that I get scared, really scared. And I'll tell you what scares me. Because we now have a, an ecclesia, we do, and it's building and growing, none of you feel like you have to do what we believe might need to be done. So you may choose not to believe in it. And if you choose not to believe in what we believe in and trust our insight, there will be nothing we can or should do about that other than let you, let you be that. And we may end up with less resource in our pot to fulfill the vision that we have. Now, should I be scared? No, but I'm letting you know that to say that the implications of this, if there was a hierarchy whereby it was like, you have to do what you're told, we could probably get more stuff done potentially, but at what cost? At what cost? Um, we are the body of Christ and we are gonna be one body and everybody is going to hopefully want to be part of that. Okay, we all right? 
Now, why do we need... Um, can you learn something from everyone else in this room, or do you already know it all? That was rhetorical. Surely we can all learn from one another. Um, now, why do we need to learn? Why do we need to learn? Because the other part of the, the, the horizontal is like, to some extent, we're all okay as we are because we're all accepted as we are. So why do we need to learn anything or become anything if we're okay as we are? Now, the truth is we don't need to change or do anything to be um, loved, and we don't need to change or be anything to be right. But wouldn't it be nice to do this thing called life really well? We have that buzzword, don't we? Well-being, well-being. And, and we were talking about to be, to be. What about if we were being well? What about if we could do this thing called life really well by learning as much as we possibly can from everybody else about how they do life really well so that between us, we do this thing called life really, really well because we have one shot at it. And all of those things that Chris put on the board about depression and mental health. I mean, the mental health problems in schools now is school's biggest challenge across the country. They, um, we are having to do a massive piece of work on it with the company I work for because school leaders are saying this is their big issue. Children and young people are not well. And I am convinced it is because of what we are talking about tonight that they have been told you can go it alone. We're not supposed to go it alone. That's not the same as saying, do as you're told. That's saying, no, you can go, you can be you, but be you alongside everybody else. That, that's amazing. That's how it's supposed to be, not just go it alone. Now, um, some of you, like me, listened because we believed that there was a boss um, and that we had to get it right. Um, but now I'm, I have no fear about that anymore, but I don't have to do this anymore, but I am so excited about choosing to do it. I choose to listen to you people because I think you're all great and can teach me stuff. That's my choice, not my obligation, not something I'm afraid not to do. It's just a really, really good idea to learn from other people and love, learn from people around you. Now, um, I think I'm gonna show you that video clip now. I'm going to just do this last little bit because this doesn't apply to me, but this applies to some of you. Others of you don't listen to anybody because you believe you've got the right to decide for yourself. That's fine. Um, you can live like you can live your own way. Um, the thought that came to me today, and I, I knew it was something I had to say, was living your own way can make you really dumb. Now, I don't mean dumb as in stupid. I mean dumb as in you know that word for mute. Like if you're a mute, the, the word is dumb. When, you're living, when you go quiet and you won't be transparent about where you're at or what you think or what you're doing, you're living life dumb. And if you're living life dumb, it's a symptom of the fact that you are not willing to come under a wisdom that might help you. So I'm going to give some of you a little key. If you have not speaking up, and not saying what you need to say and feel like you get with someone and just let it out. Speak up, be willing to stand under a hammer wisdom, and it's going to free some of you no end. Okay, now let's watch this video clip. Chris found this today and she sent it to me, and then um, she said, Do you think this will work? And I went, Yes, brilliantly, I think it will. I want you to catch the spirit of this. It's a clip from Patch Adams, and basically Patch Adams has broken the rules of doctorhood. You cannot do what you're doing if you're a doctor. He's let people come into his home and he's been treating them, not through the official channels, and you're not supposed to do that. But the spirit of his response is what we are getting at um, in this journey. Um, where we're going. So it's only about three or so minutes long. And then, yeah, all right. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're gonna finish, but I mean, I hope you caught the heart of that. It, it was what we've been talking about because actually we can be each other's doctors and we can be each other's 
patience. And we need to be willing to be both to be both. Um, and what he said about indifference, that can be the problem. When we, we, we don't involve ourselves, I wrote on here that I believe our expression of kingdom is about our ever-present involvement in this thing called life, not about a compliance to a lifestyle dictated from on, on high. Are we willing to be a patient and a doctor with each other? Because if we are, um, that's pretty special, and we will be that ecclesia, and and that it, it's yeah, we will, we will improve the quality of life. That's what he said. So this is a great et- enterprise. It's a great enterprise. Um, what are we singing? Okay, right. This is that. Uh, this is going to be then our call to action. We're going to take the offering in a minute. Um, and pay it forward. But if we're going to go and we're going to be, let's as our prayer tonight stand. And what we're going to go and we're going to be is we're going to be each other's doctors and we're going to be each other's patients and we're going to be the ecclesia. So make this last song um, a prayer and God help us to walk this out and to trust one another as we move forward. Bless you. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all The Rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk Then why not support The Rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.